Good morning, everyone. Welcome to the American Enterprise Institute. It's nice to see you all here uh, in the auditorium and those of us, those joining us live online for our live streaming. My name is Mackenzie Eaglin. I'm a resident fellow here at AEI for many years, where I've worked with great Americans like Secretary McCarthy. It's a pleasure to host him. I'm thrilled to have him here this morning. I, I under-caffeinated specifically to, to keep calm uh, just for his benefit, but he, I hear he's pretty high energy, so we're going to have a little fun this morning. Uh, the Honorable Ryan McCarthy, I know he needs no introduction. You're here because you know exactly who he is, but quickly let me just give you the the, refre the refresher. He's a man who lets no grass grow beneath his feet, as I quickly learned this morning. Uh, he's been Secretary of the Army since November, excuse me, since September, and before that was Under Secretary for two years. So um, a great vantage point from which we can talk about a lot of priorities this morning. He's a veteran of the Army's 75th Ranger Regiment, and he has a blend of experience on Capitol Hill, in defense industry, and even in finance. Uh, he served in the Army between 1997 and 2002, deploying to Afghanistan. He holds a Bachelor of Arts in History from VMI and an MBA from the University of Maryland. In his time leading the Army in both of his uh, jobs, the Secretary has been busy identifying the big six modernization priorities, well known. I think you've done a great job where we all know what they are. Uh, realigning investments toward them uh, in the famous or infamous uh, process dubbed Night Court and helping stand up the Army's future command in Austin, Texas. So the Secretary is going to give brief opening remarks, after which he and I will just chat, and then we will, we will welcome you to join that conversation. And if you're joining us online, or I guess even if you're here, if you, want, if you think your question might not get answered or, or you want me to consider it, I have the iPad up here. And uh, we'll be also to accepting questions via Twitter. Just use the hashtag UncleSamAEI. And uh, I'll try and include it in your name and, and, and question for the secretary. And so without any further ado, Mr. Secretary, thanks. Thank you, Mackenzie. I, I, I love this room. <laughs> this, uh, this is great. Uh, but thank you for inviting me today and having this opportunity. Uh, when the Army's really relied heavily on uh, the think tank community to help us think through a lot of these challenges, this is uh, an amazing time for the Army in the form of transformation. Uh, so uh, appreciate this opportunity. I'll try to limit my remarks so that we can have more of a discussion with all of you that came today. So thanks for coming. Uh, it, you know, we uh, we talk about a lot of the things that we're doing to try to transform the force, but with 180,000 people deployed in 140 countries, readiness will always remain our number one priority. We've been uh, very fortunate uh, from the 1819 budget deal to have the funding we needed to help uh, focus our, our efforts against that. We had roughly two brigade combat teams at the highest levels of readiness three years ago. Today, we're north of 25. And that is as much funding as it is the focus and energy of people like Mark Milley and Jim McConville, Sergeant Major Tony Grinston. Because the focus and energy against our training plans was large, was so the leader-driven aspect of that was truly remarkable. Because whether you're talking to those senior folks or a battalion commander in the 1st Infantry Division in, in Kansas, they all sounded the same. They all knew exactly what they had to work against. So the focus and energy on the fundamentals, but you got to have funding. So uh, we're working very hard on this 20 to 21 budget deal, and we need to close it as soon as possible. Uh, but readiness has been uh, a very uh, key focus for us. It will always be number one when you have troops deployed, in particular in combat operations. So we are 60% of combatant commander's requirements worldwide. Mm -hmm. So over half of our balance sheet is focused on people and training. And uh, so uh, more to follow on that. What you'll see over the course of this next year is a focus on strategic readiness and what makes the difference. Emergency deployment readiness exercises for brigade size elements to Europe, East Asia. Defender series, what we're going to do is send CONUS-based divisions to go train in Europe and Asia to uh, work on dynamic type of employment around all around those areas of operation and train with our coalition partners. So uh, a lot of effort with that. So that's really bringing us to the master's degree level and readiness outside of the individual and collective training we do in squad and platoon size elements to, the, to larger echelons like that of a brigade and division. We've been in the midst of a, of a major transformation in the force and our modernization enterprise. Over the course of two fiscal cycles, two POM cycles, if you will, uh, of a five-year uh, budget plan, we've moved north of $40 billion against our ambition in 31 signature systems. 
that we are developing across six modernization priorities. So a lot of effort and energy in developing these systems. So over the course of this 18 months that's in front of us, these prototypes are landing and we're gonna see whether or not they work. And if they do, that's kind of a good problem to have. The good thing is, is we can bring them into the forest. The challenge is you gotta pay for them. So more of the night court kind of experiences you've heard where we had to reshape our balance sheet to finance our ambition. We've restructured against the problem, creating a four-star command, an Army Futures Command, six investment, six plus two investment priorities. We have synthetic training and also position navigation and timing, which complement those six investment priorities. But when 80% of the S&T is against the investment priorities and over half of procurement, we're trying to put our money where our mouth is. We're trying to signal to OSD and Congress and industry, this is where we're trying to take the Army and we need your help. And we've seen that. Industry has uh, vastly increased its investments. Uh, north of where they had been uh, three years ago, well north of 2% uh, against their revenue. So exciting times from that standpoint. But we have to maintain that commitment and that trust with all those stakeholders that I mentioned before. So with this FY21 budget that we're gonna send across the river here shortly, we're gonna start building the 22 that focus and energy will be the discipline against what we've set out. So a lot of it is what we're trying to do, what General McConville and I described is finish what we started. And uh, so a lot of energy will be against those two priorities. But one of the things you're gonna hear General McConville and I talk a lot about is people. People are our most precious resource, we're a people organization. And the challenges that we've had with people, sexual assault numbers continued to rise over the last several years, suicide. There are things that are tearing away the fabric of our institution. And the only way that we can think of doing it better is just being better teammates, building cohesive teams. General McConville and I eat together all the time. When, we're, when we get a chance, we'll work out together. We try to send a message to the system. Teammates look each other in the face. Teammates invest in each other, getting soldiers back into the chow hall to eat together. This generation is different than the ones that we grew up through, the way we grew up. But some of those simple fundamentals of investing time in each other will help you improve and help you understand who you're dealing with. So when they have challenges, you're there for them. So uh, trying to focus on the simple things, we're trying to do that by exhibiting the right behaviors and building uh, cohesive teams. But also is investing in people. We're investing in IT systems. We're changing the evaluation processes of how we pick talent to lead in our formations. Because it's as much about an individual knowing who they are and what are, their, what are their best way for them to reach their potential, but also to get the right people in the right jobs, have the right chemistry so the, the institution performs better. Uh, General McConville is very passionate about this. He's bringing a lot of these things to bear as I speak with uh, battalion commander's assessments and brigade commander's assessments. We have a, a one-star board that's underway. So we're gonna see a lot of changes in people uh, well before Christmas. So it's exciting times for the Army. We're trying to continue to meet national demands, but transform ourselves at the same time. Very challenging, uh, exciting, but we have an extraordinary uh, set of leaders that are driving that. It's great to be here. Thanks. Thanks for those remarks. That was terrific scene setter. Uh, I guess we should talk about the first most pressing issue, and no, it's not Lieutenant Colonel Vindman, but it's actually the today as um, the first day of funding in the next CR through December 20th. Mm -hmm. And you talked about needing to wrap up that budget as soon as possible. Uh, the Senate Majority Leader has indicated this is one of his top priorities, and I believe it's because of his sympathy for the Defense Department and the unique harm that continuing resolutions cause on DOD in particular. We feel like they can get there. How, is your, how have your conversations been going and are you preparing for the worst? We always prepare for the worst in the Pentagon. Uh, <laughs> I'm half facetious there. The, uh, the, so first off, with what a continuing resolution does to the Department of Defense. From a readiness standpoint, we had to notify our commands oh, about a month, 45 days ago to reduce your, your investment or expenditures in operations and maintenance by 2%. So you started turning the knob down on training. Mm -hmm. From an individual to a collective, it has an impact across the system, so you're immediately starting to decline. Mm -hmm. We're gonna have to probably do that again here right before Christmas. So the buying power of a battalion or brigade commander is declining. 
less repetitions, less spare parts, less everything. And, that, and coupled with the reduction of repetitions, which time is the, the variable here, you don't get back. Right. So even if you get the money at Christmas, you just lost 90 days where you, could, you weren't out at 100%. And in our business, you got to get every repetition you can before you get on that airplane and go do the nation's business. So um, for us, that's why we're, we're running across the river a lot. Uh, so from readiness standpoint, we're, we're very concerned we need to get that turned back on as quickly as possible. Modernization, there's about $3.5 billion in buying power that's frozen. Mm. We have about 79 new programs, another 37 production line increases, production increases to, uh, to programs that we want to turn this on as quickly as possible because, like I mentioned before, 31 signature systems. A lot of these are prototypes and capabilities we want to get on hand, we want to test as quickly as possible and start buying ill rip tranches to field our formations. So readiness and modernization, the impact's already felt. And the thing we always talk about is, well, it's, it's parts, it's jobs, it's time for our people. That's one that bothers okay. me the most, okay. and the one I'm most concerned about in getting that back. You, you can't get it back. You gotta make the most of every day. Uh, so um, we've been talking uh, a great deal. Uh, General McConville and I, General Martin, Jim McPherson, uh, our leadership team's been going across the river all the time. Uh, the good thing is, is I think they're very close on the NDAA, which will be a great step forward. And if uh, this, uh, what will probably be a continued resolution to Christmas, will afford enough time with that framework in place uh, to knock out a deal. So if there's some wood in here, I can touch it. But, uh, <laughs> but, uh, but we're going we're gonna to be, I mean, we're, we're going to go to the Army-Navy game. Obviously, that's a... That's a command performance. We'll be there. Uh, but we're going to be constantly going back and forth to try to get this done. We, the Defense Department has a responsibility to play because of the size and scale of our budget and in the scheme of the President's budget. So we will be there to explain, articulate, and help negotiate the best outcome we can. Well, since you're here, uh, we can say go Army. Uh, and the other secretaries are not. <laughs> Maybe that's a little encourage them to come on over. Yeah. Uh, Let's continue on the modernization, but I want to look backward just briefly. Sure. So um, the night court process was effective, basically, where you, Secretary Esper, and the uniform leadership basically went line by line through the Army budget, uh, decided uh, you focused a lot on legacy. You focused mostly on equipment, but also business processes and other reforms uh, in the back, so-called back office. And you reinvested. You took money from a lot of legacy capabilities and tried to put it towards, as you referenced already, 80% S&T. And buying the future more quickly, and buying it now, and buying it in the future year's defense plan, in the five-year window that uh, you're programming under, and, and trying to make change happen. So your old boss is now the Secretary of Defense. He's now applying that same model across, well, he's starting with the fourth estate at the Defense Department, meaning mostly defense agencies, uh, but he will then move towards the services, as I've been told. So can, what are your lessons learned for Night Court? And I mean in this sense politically mostly, but any lesson. Capitol Hill seemed to have been mostly responsive. I think you also played the game, uh, not the game, I think you, you, uh, you Freudian <laughs> slip, Mackenzie. <laughs> <laughs> it is slightly Freudian. Having worked on the Hill, both of us, you understand what I mean. Yeah, you were very politically savvy in how you uh, presented the request. Uh, you kept options open. The things that were most, I think, consequential to members of Congress, like the Chinook uh, and other production lines, um, there were options where they have a year or two or three, in some cases, to decide what they want to do. You put the burden on them. Uh, how, has the, how has Congress reacted to the total process, you know, the all in money? and do you feel good about that? And is that a good model going forward? So if they were to slap the table today on the budget, the way the bills are marked, we would go 185 for 186. So that's like Michael Jordan free throw percentage. I feel pretty good about that. <laughs> but I think a lot of that was because of the hard work. And what, that, that, those, what those numbers mean, my apologies, 93 truncated buys, 93 terminations. But to the points that McKenzie was making, the terminations were over time. And the reason why is we still need these capabilities in our formations for years to come. And you want to be able to work with the manufacturers that are doing business with you to make those adjustments. Many of them are competing for the new opportunities. 
So from a business leader's perspective, you're still getting a couple of years of orders. You're competing for new business. They can make adjustments with their production lines and their tooling and other things of that nature so that they can adjust, hit it in stride. We just don't want to, sorry, you know, close the plant. We need them. <laughs> you know, so um, from that standpoint, there was the allow them the plan, the opportunity, because the cuts are across a FIDIP. Some of it was impacted in the immediate term of the 20 or the 21, but a lot of the funding needs to be back end loaded mm -hmm. because if we're successful in these next 18 months, these, these prototypes deliver, you're gonna need a lot of money to start bringing tranches, dozens, hundreds of these widgets into the formations by that time frame. That helps industry adjust, it helps Congress manage expectations, it allows us the time to see if this stuff's gonna work. Mm -hmm. And then collectively we come together and we make a, an adjustment downstream. So um, we, um, we've learned a lot from, uh, I, I learned a lot from the Gates experience when I, when I worked for him uh, over 10 years ago. And, uh, and uh, you know, in Dr. Esper's experience in industry, his knowledge of Capitol Hill, we didn't want, you know, it was a huge shock to people. Right. We didn't want it to be a shock wave, you know, so we needed the support of all of the stakeholders that we described before. And we worked very hard to communicate with industry leaders and, and OSD and then work with Congress uh, to communicate our intent. And one of the greatest things that I think w that we did as a service is we published a modernization strategy. And then we put the money against that stuff. So we're not going to, we're not going to, you know, curveball somebody who may, you know, like if a corporation makes investments instead of dividends to their shareholders, that they can justify it. Here's a document they gave the Congress. Here's the testimony they gave the Congress. Here's what they did at the AEI event, right? The, the <laughs> consistency has to be there or they're not going to go along with you. Yeah. And we need industry to invest and we need Congress to support it. Well done. That's a, a wonderful campaign plan, if you will. Uh, it's impressive and I know <laughs> And I, I think the Secretary of Defense um, will be approaching it the same way. And if uh, I, the term was flood the zone, uh, and actually, and it's it's well done how how you were able to shift what is very hard to do, which are entrenched interests, but in an, in for a better cause, I guess you could say. Uh, so. Quickly, I want to expand since those of us who aren't following it every day, you mentioned that the, the six plus two. Can you talk a little more about the plus two? Sure. Um, long range precision fires, next generation combat vehicle, future vertical lift, the network, integrated air missile defense, soldier lethality. Uh, the, you have the key priorities, the weapon systems, uh, but, but there's a position navigation timing and synthetic training environment. Those are the plus two. A synthetic training environment could be applicable to a long-range precision fires artillery crew, to a helicopter pilot, to an armored vehicle, to a to an uh, and a network. If you're running a communication system, integrated air and missile defense, or even a soldier who's going through a door to clear a room, all of those scenario-based training on synthetic training could be applicable to all of them. So that's why it wasn't a standalone priority because it's going to have to support all of them. From a perspective of position, navigation, and timing, the Army is heavily investing in low Earth orbit satellite architecture. And in order for us to maximize our long range precision fires portfolio or our missile defense portfolio and to queue, you know, assault reconnaissance, helicopters, whatever the shooter capability is going to be, you're going to need a satellite architecture that can find stuff and move information quickly. And it'll be resilient much more resilient than, than uh, other, other potential uh, capabilities. So um, we're working uh, very closely with commercial industry, as well as the National Reconnaissance Organization and others, to build as many partnerships as we can, because the goal for us is that to have satellite capability down to the brigade command level, for a brigade commander to be able to own and task a satellite a system. Uh, to work in their battle space, where historically you have to have national assets support special operations or much higher echelons uh, in our formations. I had one Army general tell, tell me, Leo, low Earth orbit satellites are, are it. It's the future. It's, it's, 
if we're talking like a hub and spoke or sun and planets kind of thing, it's the sun. Mm -hmm. And everything else is going to kind of work around that, and it's, it's that important to the future. Would you agree? If you think about how do you maximize our entire modernization effort, uh, largely it'll be cloud architecture to move the data and satellites. So uh, it's probably why you've heard uh, General McConville and I talk so much about it over the last two years, which normally most Army leadership probably would not talk about satellites as much as we have, uh, because we recognize that, that we need to have a resilient satellite architecture, but also in order to maximize our long-range fires portfolio, we're going to be able to fire munitions exponentially further than we ever had previously. How are you going to find it? How are you going to find targets? How are you going to queue it from a command and control perspective? We've got to have this capability. And uh, we, we put a lot of money against that effort. We're, we're working uh, very closely with leaders in the commercial satellite industry. But there's going to be a lot of things we're going to have to figure out uh, about working with commercial entities. So um, this is very new for the department. Over this next year to 18 months, this is one of the key prototypes that we'll be testing at a, a combat training center. So that we'll put it down at a, at a lower echelon, and they're going to be able to work with this capability. Never been done before. We're very excited about that. Wow. Uh, I don't want to diminish the importance of the cloud either, which, of course, we all know is in the news with our new neighbors, uh, HQ2 Amazon here in town. Um, but to talk about the Army and the cloud and uh, its role in thinking about the future battlefield and uh, the importance to you, and maybe if it's di different or separate in any way from the other contract. Um, well, we're, we're just getting started. We put about seven north of $700 million across the FIDIP, mm -hmm. and that's, that's largely to inventory all of our data, get the software development support so that we can get all of the data across the Army under the right standards and formats, and then to make that transition or migration to a cloud architecture. So a lot of this is infrastructure build mm -hmm. over the next 24 months. Uh, and um, what provider we use, we'll, we'll, as, you know, as we proceed, we'll, we'll ultimately select someone. But the, what cloud architecture will do for us, so much of combat is speed of decision making. And if you can have a machine crunch the data and pass it to, from a sensor, sensor node, found bad guy, you can use an artillery piece, you can use an, uh, an armor reconnaissance helicopter, whatever the weapon system of choice is, to be able to cue it in a second. Today it takes minutes. In a firefight, that is eternity. So it's for us to be able to have a machine help us crunch the information, pass it, Target acquired. Now we'll have a human in the loop, uh, but that's something that policymakers will face in the years to come. Will China and Russia behave the same way? Uh, and I think that's, that's the sort of thing. Henry Kissinger wrote a great piece on this about maybe a year or two ago about just philosophically for American ideals, how will we be able to embrace this? America's not ready for this. No. And it's to start having these conversations to educate ourselves about what it's going to mean. Because the system can crunch the data and give you an answer very quickly, but it doesn't have context. Mm -hmm. Only a human being can bring the context to a decision. And that's where, as, as we proceed and this technology gets more and more mature and it gets fed into a weapon system, those are very challenging times ahead of us. I've had multiple senior defense leaders Uniformed and civilian over the last several months, as we talk about all of the same challenges you're discussing, uh, lament you know the degradation of the other tools of, of American statecraft and power, not just you know diplomacy or sanctions or any foreign aid or whatever, but um, in this case information operations, something that basically we used to do a lot of, and now and it, and what, on one hand you understand it with the with the Internet of Things and just the Internet in general how hard it, you know, things like Voice of America and uh, broadcasting uh, Commando Solo over Afghanistan, you know, uh, radio, you know, with a bullhorn, basically. Uh, those seem so antiquated, but at the same time, now we almost do nothing. Uh, and I'm worried, you know, thinking in terms of the national defense strategy and 
long-term competition with China and Russia, China in particular, you know, you often hear senior leaders talk about their whole of society, whole of everything, China response. They do this not just in one segment of one piece of a government agency, but across uh, the nation. Uh, private industry, private loose term, uh, and, and in many other ways. How are we doing on information operations as a U.S. government more broadly, and is this something you're thinking about or worried about as you look at the NDS? Absolutely. Uh, we're, uh, you give you the best example of where we're, we're really uh, executing that capability with precision. In Afghanistan, the one thing that I've noticed in working this problem set literally since October of 2001 in a variety of different jobs, this is the first time that I've been to Afghanistan where I've seen such energy and effort behind information operations. And we have uh, an organization within the special operations folks that are uh, implementing this capability because where have we been losing against the Taliban? It's at the street level. That they've shown the ability to execute the rule of law. Mm. Whether you like it or not, they can perform the service. Right. And if the Afghan government can't, what's your alternative? That's why the Taliban was winning on the street. One of the things they're doing now uh, very effectively, and you see the reduction uh, of attacks by the Taliban from this, is that the Afghan government, working with their, uh, their partners, us and, the, and, the, and some of the NATO folks are still there, is that um, we're able to show at the street level that the Afghan government can provide services fix electricity, provide security, but they're winning in the cognitive space. It's amazing, you know, if you, when you went there in the invasion 18 years ago from right now, they didn't have any electricity. Now it looks like some American cities at night, right? They got street lights, and I mean, it's, it's amazing, and they're getting iPhones, and they're getting telephones, and they're, they're on the, uh, the internet. And the Taliban's trying to beat us there by showing, hey, we're better at this, because they're, tr they're, they're, they're trying to see who's gonna run the country. Who's going to win ultimately? Um, what we've been able to do recently is show the Afghans can respond from a security standpoint or services, and it's starting to build more confidence in the people. Now, is that in a, in a position to leave any time in the near future? Probably not, but we can look at what are the ways in which you can reduce the size of your footprint and bring the Afghans up. Winning in the cognitive domain is incredibly important. We're looking at some organizational adjustments within the Army, uh, investments uh, for information operations, because that's really what, when Secretary Mattis uh, published the NDS, that's where great power, great power competition is. Yep. Win ideas against competitors. It's not being kinetic worldwide. So that's everything from advise and assist, but it's also in the information space to be able to communicate our values as a country and what we bring to the world. Uh, so we do have to do better on that front. We're making the investments there. We're even gonna make some organizational changes within the Army associated with that. So uh, much more effort to come, but we've learned a great deal at the street level in Afghanistan and we've adjusted. If we could stick with the national defense strategy for a moment. So in your opening remarks, um, you talked about the Army, you know, 180,000 soldiers currently deployed and that you're 60% of combatant commander requirements. That's, that's a big job. Uh, talk about the tension between meeting those daily requirements, the wolf closest to the sled, you know, the tyranny of the now, versus this pivot to, to competition, and how you're reconciling that. Yeah, I don't get a lot of sleep. But they pay you the big bucks, right? <laughs> yeah. uh, it's, it's incredibly hard. And I think that why you saw the activities that we took, uh, the, the activities that we took over the last uh, two years in particular, of why we had to make such hard choices within just the research and development and acquisition portfolios, because this was fixed. We could not adjust. So uh, making some very hard choices with you know, truncating buys and terminations, but also a lot of risk in our future and making some of these choices. We, uh, until national demand goes down, uh, we're not going to be able to adjust or do, mu do, do many things different than what we've done for the last two night courts. Uh, but what Secretary Esper is trying to drive uh, consistently is we're looking at NDS implementation and choices. So he brings literally 
all the leadership. COCOMs are up on the screens and service secretaries and chiefs every Monday. We work on this stuff. And it's bringing the risk back to our level and looking at choices. Mm -hmm. And where do we compete globally? Mm -hmm. What types of capabilities do we need in certain places <laughs> where you have real world combat operations underway? What are the capabilities they need and how are we doing against the objectives for that foreign policy problem set? So um, a lot of choices are on the table and he's getting ready to make some hard decisions. <laughs> Let me just pin you down a little bit here. So is it possible, it's not in the Defense Department's DNA to say no, right? Uh, you're a can-do, who are kind of organization, you'll find a way to duct tape whatever the solution is together and execute. Uh, it's one of the reasons why I think Congress, it's hard for members who don't sit on defense committees to understand why CRs are so hard, right? Because instead of like, parking aircraft in a hangar, you figure out a way to still fly. It's just reduced and it's stretched and then et cetera, but you figure it out and everyone thinks you'll always figure it out. Is there some responsibility on the most senior leaders like yourself to start to find ways to say no? or to better talk about the risk, if we keep doing everything the way we've always done it, we will not deliver on the defense strategy as you think we've told you we will. Mm -hmm. Well, um, there's a first thing we're doing more of is we're actually meeting with members that are not on the committees of jurisdiction. I had breakfast with two senators that are not on the committees of jurisdiction this morning. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and it brings a much greater appreciation for the challenges that we face. Uh, so we have a responsibility to do that with senators or in local communities to get out and, and articulate how hard it is to be in this business. There's a, it's kind of that, uh, it's kind of the tension between uh, America's responsibilities in the world uh, and, and, that, and that almost that form of American exceptionalism to just the hard realities of being $23 trillion in debt and we got to do something about this. Um, but um, we make these recommendations about, and then ultimately it's a national objective, we're going to do this in Africa or South America, that you can make those choices. Um, with the NDS comes that hard reality, but ultimately those decisions will be made in the Oval Office. Mm -hmm. Thank you. All right, so I want to close out our Q&A on your favorite topic, people. Uh, so let's talk about let's talk about those great men and women who serve, but also their families, also Army civilians, who I know are essential to the work, uh, to executing all of the things that we have talked about. So there's a new ad campaign. What's your warrior? Can you talk a little bit about that and what what you're trying to achieve with that? Yes, uh, we kind of came to that realization the hard way uh, <laughs> over the last uh, we, we missed in 2018. And, we missed, uh, we missed our recruiting target for the active force by 6,500 people. That was a big miss. And uh, we kind of huddled up and realized we needed to make some pretty big changes. And at the end of the, the 2018 cycle, we had a, a commercial, um, Warriors Wanted. Now, I was in the Ranger Regiment. I'm a middle-aged man. And Millie was in Special <laughs> Forces. And McConville's an aviator, attack aviator. Esper was in the infantry. And, and it comes on ESPN at 9.30 at night, and we all call each other, and we're like, that was awesome. <laughs> you know, fast roping into a target and flashbangs. And, and then we realized four middle-aged men watching ESPN at 9.30 at night are the ones watching this commercial. We realized, like, we're not looking so good, are we? And the, the campaign didn't work. So we went back and uh, we changed the advertising firms. We reorganized our marketing organization and we focused on 22 cities in the country. We didn't rely on a, that certain kind of hook from the Carolinas to Texas where we do very well in recruiting because of this position of our installations and mm -hmm. we've got home field advantage. So we, we realized we needed a much more comprehensive look at the country. Why? Because we wanted to improve with women. We wanted to improve with minorities. We wanted to have a comprehensive cohort of men and women that represent everybody in the country. Mm -hmm. And with that, you kind of had to be like a college football coach. We were out visiting cities and talking to mayors and superintendents of schools to get that civic leader support. I visited eight cities in the last 14 months. And uh, you know, it, so it was the hard push to help those lo those, po those folks down at the you know the local battalions, 
but to energize the system. And with those opportunities to talk, we talked to mayors, we talked to why we need so much money and why what, the things that we do. So it was connecting with the country and it helped us. Now the What's Your Warrior is, uh, and if you've seen the commercials, uh, it's much more representative of this generation and uh, it almost looks like a, cart uh, like a, a video game. Uh, and then the end of that field, when they're all kind of standing in the field, looks like an Avengers movie, right? Mm -hmm. But it shows those men and women, there's about 150 different operational specialties in the Army. You can do a lot more than just faster open into targets. And uh, there are scientists, there are cyber experts, there are lawyers, doctors. So we wanted to show them there's vast opportunity for you to reach your potential. Uh, we had like 100 million hits in the first week on YouTube. So uh, I'm told that's pretty good. So, the, you know, <laughs> but the, uh, so we're excited about it. But you, so much of the expertise of marketing is you hit a pair of eyeballs, you got to hit them again like five or six times before you can get a young man or woman to come through the door and have a conversation. So it's, uh, it's got to be unrelenting, but we're bringing sophistication, geofencing. So, I. Uh, when I'm on my iPhone and I'm looking for a pair of running shoes and I don't buy the shoes, every time I turn my phone on, Nike, yeah. Nike, <laughs> Nike, and I finally get enough, give them to me. And I'm like, you know, and you, and you buy them finally, right? right. So uh, we're, we're using techniques like that and it's, it's showing improvement because we can't do the 1980s brick and mortar salesman knocking on doors with a trunk full of samples. We, we need sophistication to compete, especially with 3.6% unemployment. So. Uh, we're, getting, we're bringing more sophistication, we're changing the way we're doing things, and we're trying to improve. I really, I, I did not know, and I'm glad to hear about your focus on the cities, your outreach to civic leaders in particular. Well done. Uh, what's the response been from mayors? Is it, you know, we need more of the Army with Homeland Defense? Like, what are you doing to help with the wildfires? Or is it just, uh, no, we understand what big Army's doing in the world? I always tell this story when people ask me about it. There is so much goodwill in the country but people are just busy. When, when I was being vetted for this, or well, the undersecretary job, I was living in a suburb of Dallas. And the FBI talked like everybody in my neighborhood, and so I'd come home at night and there'd be grand marquees all over the neighborhood, and guys with short haircuts and dark suits were talking to my neighbors. And within a couple of days, there's an American flag in front of every house in the neighborhood. And they threw us a barbecue, and they're like, good luck, you know. And, uh, and, um, there's, a, there's tremendous goodwill, but people are busy. And if you don't have a, a Fort Bragg down the street, you're just, it's, it's not that they don't care. Right. It's they got to get to work. they got to pick up their kids. they got soccer practice, and they, they're just they blink, and it's 9 o'clock at night. Yep. So we had to get out and engage. The mayors are all incredibly supportive, and they, and they want the young kids in their area to be able to reach their potential. And if they can't afford to go to college or they want to find a job, there's an opportunity to serve in this institution, get credentialed, access to tuition, and to be able to have to tech, some technical expertise on the other side of a three, four year horizon. Those are great citizens to bring back to your cities. Mm -hmm. So uh, they've been incredibly supportive. I was in Denver about two weeks ago, and uh, uh, it's Mayor Hancock and then Mayor Turner in Houston, and it's just Mayor Lightfoot in Chicago. They're incredibly supportive of us and they want to help us. We sign these agreements called PAYS, Partnership for Youth Success. So what it does is if a kid joins the Army, in three or four years they want to hang them up, they're guaranteed a job interview, not a job, a job interview with two organizations under an umbrella agreement with the city of Chicago, the city of Denver. And um, they get excited about that. And the police department loves it because they'll get 20,000 applicants for 800 jobs and they push a lot of people away. So those police departments say, hey, take a look at these folks. And if we have the opportunity to hire them, we can send a product back that was in a right guy, you know, man or woman who was in a rifle platoon for four years, did a tour in Afghanistan. It'd be great to have those folks on the police force. So, for example, so we've been, we've, uh, the more and more we engage, uh, we've, we've, it's been tremendous yield and benefit for recruiting, but also for folks just to understand the challenges we face, and they're extremely supportive. And uh, lastly, just tell me, in your roughly three years at the top doing this job, tell me, uh, tell me your most inspirational story or moment or someone that you met and that helps you get out of bed every morning. Um, 
God, your your kid's gonna have a home run back here. You know, I'm, I'm having to choke up, but uh, <laughs> um, I won't tell the name of the family. But uh, about a year ago, it was a a Green Beret was killed in Afghanistan, and uh, I'm gonna have to say it slow so I don't choke up. But uh, General Milley and I, Sergeant Major Daly, did the DT that night. Secretary Esper was traveling and uh, walk into this parlor where you meet the families before you head out to the, the flight line. And the parents are from a small town, and, and they, uh, they looked me in the face. They said, I know you're busy. Thank you for being here. The extraordinary humility of soldiers and their families and the commitment and the sacrifice. You know, you didn't feel like you deserved to be the boss when you talked to these folks. And, uh, um, you know, that fuels your resolve to, to do these things. And uh, so when you get to be around people like that. So that's the one. I have a picture of... Uh, of that family in my uh, in my office at home, and I look at it every night, and when I'm doing my homework. So, those sorts of things, uh, the quiet things that you know no one else will see. I know there was no band or parade. It was a, the most horrible event of their life, and they were still incredibly humble and grateful that their son served in our formations. And uh, you know, if that doesn't get you excited to be a part of that, then nothing will. It's a true honor to serve. All right, we're going to open it up to you guys and uh, to our Hopefully online. something lighter than that. Right? <laughs> right. <laughs> Thank you for sharing. Uh, we'll start with some questions right here. We'll try to keep our questions in the form of questions. <laughs> Thank you for a fascinating talk. Uh, I'm a retired Foreign Service. I'm also a retired Army. Uh, but I wanted to um, focus on the title of this event, which included uh, lots of robots in the, uh, in, in the title. And uh, I wanted to particularly ask about uh, the new strategy that we have and uh, the possibility of high-intensity conflict with Russia or China. Um, do we have the industrial base uh, to manufacture lots of, let's say, unmanned tanks or whatever kinds of, of robot platforms we might be using. Are you comfortable about uh, the, the state of the uh, industrial base in this country for that type of surge uh, production? No, I'm not. I think that uh, it would require the Defense Production Act for us to order Ford Motor Company to make tanks very similar to what you saw in the World War II era. We have some outstanding American companies that can produce very uh, uh, unique and in some cases exquisite capabilities, but the scale that you're talking about would require uh, some dramatic utilization of authorities uh, that would be similar to what we saw in the World War II time frame. But the, 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 I would tell you the capabilities there, you could train the trainer, you could, you could get people there, but it would require uh, very similar. There's a great book uh, uh, written about uh, what it took, uh, Freedom's Forge, uh, and, uh, and you read about um, how they did that. And it basically, you know, Roosevelt had to look at ways in which to try to start priming the pump. And the whole uh, lend-lease and these things to the Brits and sending ships was to try to start energizing those muscles. But it took the war and, the, and those authorities from Congress uh, to go turn to the American industrial base and order them to do something else. What about Mr. Secretary on a smaller scale? Are you comfortable with what the Army wants to do with AI and robotics in the industry mm -hmm. currently? So uh, we're very excited about it. You know, the, the Chinese and the Russians are investing against this, but they're trying to, in particular the Chinese, they've got to send all their kids here because we've got all the brain power, all the innovations in America. And the communist system doesn't incentivize you to innovate. So the good thing is, is their whole philosophy and way of life will inhibit their success. They're going to have to muscle their way through it and steal from us, uh, which they do. So uh, I think that um, when you, from that standpoint, the brain matters here. If we focus and have a, you know, more of a almost Manhattan Project-like focus as a, at, a, at the national level, I think you'll be able to see us move faster and, and at scale. The Army has a relationship with Carnegie Mellon University for our Artificial Intelligence Task Force, mm -hmm. uh, which is... Uh, they, they're in probably, I would say, Berkeley are the two fastest moving institutions in the country where all the thought leaders are and companies are kind of mushrooming outside the campus with both, uh, both places as well. We, we selected Carnegie Mellon 
uh, to be our hub. And we uh, have a directed spoke-like efforts through Army Futures Command, University of Texas at Austin. We have a robotics lab, Texas A&M. We're doing some testing. Uh, we have a relationship at Cal Berkeley. We're looking hard at uh, expanding MIT and others. So um, our artificial intelligence efforts are picking up, but we have to get cloud architecture. Mm -hmm. The, the cloud architecture truly maximizes the artificial intelligence-like capabilities because it's all about the speed of the, move, the, the format of the data and the speed at which you can move it. And then you can make the controls and the choices. Do you want to push it down to the tactical edge because you have to? And how fast you can move something from the tactical edge to a higher level echelon to make a much more larger scale than, uh, decision. So uh, we, we have made the cloud a priority. We put a lot of money against it. We're getting a lot of help from the private sector. Uh, but cloud has to happen to maximize AI. There's a lot of energy in AI and everybody's going to conferences and they're reading books and talking about it. But if you talk to the people in the financial industry who basically did it first, you know, the online trading with you know, writing in an algorithm that helps you make a decision whether or not to buy a barrel of oil or not, that's, that's from cloud architecture. So we, we have to put that in place and then, the, then those AI type of algorithms that we'll put into long range fires and everything else, That'll be maximized. And then all of the investments are tied together. So uh, we're, we're pressing hard there. You'll, you'll probably see more of that. Uh, Army leaders talking about um, the cloud and less so on AI because mm -hmm. you got to put the, the horse in front of the cart in order to pull it. Thank you. We'll go right here and then over here. Hi, Jen Judson with Defense News. I'm also going to ask a robotics question. Um, it's my understanding that the request for proposals that came out for the robotic combat vehicles, both light and medium, um, strongly suggests that the companies developing platforms for that work with a particular company um, that's supplying an autonomy package to the system. Um, is that a sign that, that the market isn't there in terms of autonomy packages that have been certified at this point or, or meet the standards of the Army? Is there only one company that does that? Um, you know, what's the reason for um, promoting this one autonomy package as part of, of, of the RFP for those two RCVs? Well, I, you know, I'll talk more broadly than just specific to the RFP, but the, we've got to test these technologies on a surrogate vehicle in order to see conceptually that do, are we going the right path? So we'll take a weapon system we've had in the formation for a long time, like a Bradley, but we'll put these technologies on the vehicle in order to test it. I mean, if you were to look at like Uber and uh, I mean that, you know, they have a hard time doing this on a grid in Los Angeles. We want to put on an armored vehicle and ride through the European countryside to fight the Russians at night under night vision. With people, you know, I mean, so uh, we have to do a lot of testing over the next uh, 18 or 24 months or so in order to ensure that we have the right technologies and then we can get uh, that RCV forward. But uh, our folks have been talking a lot uh, to the companies that have been doing this. And, it, you know, so it's can you bring those commercial technologies and then work with an armored vehicle manufacturer? This is really hard stuff. Hi, Dan Katz, uh, U.S. Senate. What role do you see the Army having or playing in a theoretical conflict with uh, China and East Asia? So, um, so a lot of what, you know, we're competing against China everywhere. So it's interesting, you know, the, the immediate reaction when we see uh, the discussion about how are you competing, they immediately assume we're going to, go into the first and second island chain and line up across them like a football game. We're competing in Africa and South America. They're trying to get 5G into Europe. So when you see one belt, one road, it's way more than East Asia. And why, why Secretary Esper was really smart to bring all the leadership together. How do we make choices of where to compete against them worldwide? Do you just start stacking capability in the, the island chains and you know, work in relationships with Vietnam, Thailand, and others? 
you probably need to do some of that, more advise and assist, more foreign military sales, more intel sharing, so you can strengthen those partnerships. But the things that would, you know, for me is that looking at those European partners, we gotta continue to strengthen and protect them because if they can get the belt all the way to Europe and dilute our relationships, that's where we've been the strongest, a NATO partnership for over 70 years. Uh, so uh, we, we're working very hard with them on a variety of different things, like the Defender Series exercise. We have over 40,000 troops in Europe there in the spring. Uh, we brought many of our partners, uh, the, the UK and the Australians, and put LNOs in Army Futures Command. So we're looking very hard at how we can invest together in our operability of our weapon systems, along with the training that I mentioned before. Uh, so what I would tell you is you advise your member of Congress that uh, it's, it's looking at the whole chessboard. We obviously got to do well. Half of the world's GDP goes to the South China Sea every day. We're going to have to play there. But there are other places that we have to make choices. And that's where the, the real chess match begins. Let me ask a question from online. So you talked about your teammate approach with uh, the chief and trying to broadcast you know, um, uh, how to improve unit cohesiveness, friendships, and relationships to also bring up, to tackle some challenges that you're confronting in the Army. Um, does this have implications? I know uh, the chief has talked a lot about uh, changes to the Army promotion system, particularly with an emphasis on the officer corps, but I think there's more to come. So, you know, you talked about eating the chow hall together and how, you know, this is a different era. A lot of people live outside the post gates. Mm -hmm. A lot of people don't have to go to the PX because Amazon brings what they need to the door, et cetera. So just sort of in, does this mean that there are potential, you know, this concept of teammates and building relationships um, and the way we all live now? Do you want to see changes to the Army's uh, promotion system? You know, could it possibly mean that soldiers would stay with a unit longer throughout their career, other kinds of things like that? Yeah, the, the chief is very uh, motivated to find a way to stabilize tours, mm -hmm. greater continuity at installations so that you're not moving a lot. It's very hard on families. It's hard to build that continuity on a team and improve. And have the right chemistry takes a while to build. And then once you get it, PCS orders. So we are, we're going to publish some policies by the end of the year that will allow uh, that flexibility for soldiers to manage their careers, not to be punished by it, but to still be able to have five or six years at Fort Bragg instead of two. And we know that'll help families, it'll help units, uh, reduce the, the volume of moves every summer. Mm -hmm. I mean, moving's so hard. And we've done it, I've done it so many times, but the, I mean, the McConville's are moving again because he's on McNair and he's moving across to, <laughs> to Fort Myer now that he's the chief and uh, he sent me text message last night, all this stop in the back of a movie. He, here's the chief driving his U-Haul across the river. <laughs> And, uh, and he, you know, and he's like, I've done this 30 times. It drives me nuts, you know. And uh, and I laughed, and and you know, realized that because you know, they, the vice has a house, the chief has a, um, but it's how hard it is, right. even if you've done it 15, 20 times. So we're going to try to work. We're going to make sure that we can reduce that, but still make sure that these folks are stay competitive, and that they have the opportunity to get promoted. Mm -hmm. I think that will be well received, Tony. Yeah. There's a microphone. Hang on. Hi, Tony Capasio with Bloomberg News. Your high, your most controversial modernization program a proposal was a CA, retiring or truncating the CH 47F by. You saw both appropriations committees were very skeptical. They asked for more analysis. The UAE has signaled an intent to buy 10 more. Is the Army going to go back in the 21 budget and push the truncated proposal again? And do you think the FMS sale to the UAE? will blunt some of the opposition that Boeing and its uh, lawmakers have uh, mobilized. So, so, you know, we learned a lot from that experience. That's why that was my 185 for 186. You, Tony may have missed Tony, that. Tony, Tony, no, although Tony identified he the one. Well. Tony identified the one very uh, succinctly. Right. The, uh, so they, the, the Congress wanted to make sure they understood the aviation portfolio strategy. And what we tried to do, and I, I take all the responsibility here, Secretary Esper made me the point man to communicate this to the Congress, and uh, that we, we had to find a way to create some trade space. You're bringing on two platforms in this decade, or next decade. Um, 
it's going to be it's going to be expensive if you're good, and that's really hard. You had to find a way to create some trade space. The the 47, we have 10% ORF. We have 10% more than we need. They're the youngest platform in the whole portfolio. So if you had to take risk somewhere, where would you go? Right there. There's no there, undoubtedly, and you have enough time to see what the replacement will be or how the formations will change by bringing in these two new systems. The cab structure will change over the next decade. So you can take the risk by doing this. Now, when we, we explain this to the members, you know, we feel confident because the industry partners that are, that are they're investing $4 to one on the Lyft platform and uh, I can't remember the exact ratio, but they're investing more dollars to our, you know, on the uh, armor reconnaissance as well. Industry is motivated. These assets are flying. We're not buying PowerPoint. I, I'm actually going to see them fly. I mean, they are they already are flying, but I can't get out of this city. But I'll see them after the first of the year. And and I've, I've seen videos. They're flying. But uh, uh, so that's exciting for us. This is a golden opportunity for us. We've got to. We have to capture this. Now, we're, we have conviction behind our effort, and we're working very hard. I went to the UAE and met with them last September. We're working with the UK as well on a procurement of 47s. We're looking very closely for the Afghans. That is years of orders to keep that supply chain warm. We have every equity there because our special operations platforms are still going to be uh, the G model 47, same production line. So uh, we know that that is going to be a robust set of orders for years to come. But we're going to have to do what we have to do to have the portfolio financed to bring two new systems on. It's right here. Thank you, Mr. Secretary. Uh, my name is Michael Smith. I'm at FDD's Center on Military and Political Power. Um, I have a question about public support um, for, for what the Army does and whether modernization is going to have any effect on it. Um, I flew back from Egypt last week with, with a number of folks who'd finished tours with the MFO in the Sinai. Um, they told me they had all the support they needed from the Army through and through, but their, their biggest downer was the fact that it seemed like the public back home in the States had no idea they were there, what they were doing there, why they were there. Um, I wonder if that's something you're concerned about in the long term and whether modernization and the increased sort of automation is going to have an effect on the need for public support for what you do around the world? Public support is, uh, it's, it makes you successful in this profession. You have to have the will of the American people behind you in the U.S. Army. It's as important as ammunition and body armor, and we have to have the American people behind us. Because uh, that's, that's where the support from Congress will come. If the people believe in us, that's why our brand is so important and why we care so much about the way we're perceived and our values and the men and women that serve in our formation. So um, it's something, it's why, I, why, why we went out to the American cities and tried to convince them we can take on your sons and daughters and we can help them mature as individuals and reach their potential. It, we have a responsibility as leaders in the Department of Defense to communicate to the American public why the mission on the Sinai is so important. That's a 40-year commitment to try to keep the peace in one of the toughest neighborhoods on earth. And uh, so we, we will stay true to that, but it's a, I point the thumb, I gotta do a better job. I'll take last question, right here. Hi, uh, Matt Baynard, Defense Daily. Um, so just a quick CR question. Uh, we kind of heard before the initial CR was in place that, you know, the Army could kind of weather the storm, minimize the impact under a short-term CR, uh, you know, knowing historically that that was likely going to happen. You pushed the big kind of, uh, you know, decisions and increases later in the year. So was that the case? Have you kind of been able to weather the storm so far? Um, and what's kind of been the short-term impact uh, kind of up until this point, you know, knowing that a, another CR is coming at least for another month or so? Thanks. Yeah, so we don't know how long the next one's going to be, we think, from what our, our, our friends and contacts are telling us, but uh, we think it's going to be till December. The, uh, the, you know, the cumulative impact, we're going to lose three months of the year. And you, you know, when you're trying to communicate to an organization of over a million people, 
Yeah, it's like you're trying to it's like you're trying to crank this thing up and once you get it moving, how do you get that boulder over the hill? If you stop or you kind of pump fake, you lose momentum. So to get everybody spun back up again if we get a deal in the end of December, um, we you know we, we start reducing the dial slowly. But by December, January, we're going to start cranking it harder. It won't be just a 2% reduction. It could be more. And then the heart, and you know, so that's just on a readiness standpoint. And then you get fewer repetitions on the range and fewer repetitions at platoon live fires, everything. And then from a modernization standpoint, if you're a company doing business with the Department of Defense and you go an entire quarter without buying product from, uh, from them, or less, what are they going to do? They got to face a quarterly earnings call. How are you going to adjust, CEO? And those companies are, you know, they're not small either, 100,000, 200,000 employees. So it's that it's when these massive organizations have these, these, these you know, the kind of the knee-jerk stop in the, in the process, they lose momentum. And, you, and the, the, I keep getting back to the variable that's most important to us is time. Time for our people to prepare and to mentally prepare for this. Uh, so uh, we're concerned from readiness modernization standpoint. When we see what the, the CR ultimately come, falls out the length of time, uh, we, we'll try to make the adjustment. But if it goes any further than Christmas, the numbers will start going up on the impacts. And then you'll have day for day slips. You'll have time you won't get back for training events. You will lose training events. It has a catastrophic effect over time. And one of the things I've, I've said for years is that when you have six, seven, eight years of, of continuing resolutions in a row, you end up breeding a generation of officers that don't know what an appropriations bill looks like. And they don't know what a full training plan looks like. So it's like you're breeding mediocrity in the system. Why would we do that? Well said. Uh, I don't know if the secretary has a reading list, but I'm going to hawk out uh, AEI former colleague Arthur Herman. He referenced Freedom's Forge. So thanks for, Great book. Thanks for putting that out there. Uh, you, you do not disappoint. You've been a wonderful guest. Um, we're going to thank the secretary, but please remain in your seats as he departs, and uh, let's all cheer for him together. Thank you, sir. Great weather outside, isn't it? Thanks for coming.